Hello and welcome to the session on transforming energy. I'm Afshin Yurdakuladli moderating the debate uh, this morning. Uh, we will talk about how energy assets can be deployed to shape a sustainable future in this part of the world specifically, how an effective transition to a more secure and sustainable and affordable energy system can be enabled is yet another question that we will be focusing on this morning and how reforms, energy reforms in this part of the world are redefining the region's social contract. That will be another question to keep in mind um, while we look at this broad transition uh, sweeping across the MENA region. So while at it, we should perhaps don't even need to remind you that the MENA region is one of the largest supplier of energy. It has been the case for decades, and it seems like that position will not be challenged for the foreseeable future, which is why it's important to have this conversation here um, at the World Economic Forum in Jordan. And um, we will do our best to address these uh, large issues, which are important for uh, the, the future of energy uh, globally and, and regionally. And uh, I would like to allow my, uh, I would like to uh, introduce my uh, panelists to you who will be uh, sharing their perspectives on the issues that I tried to outline broadly. And uh, please uh, allow me to introduce Mr. Jabbar Ali Luaibi, uh, Minister of Oil of Iraq, uh, Mr. Majid Jafar, CEO of Crescent Petroleum, uh, Mr. Dietmar Searsdorfer, CEO of Siemens uh, Mina region. Uh, Mr. Sami Horebi, CEO of Environmina Power Systems, and Mrs. Sarah Musa, founder of Shamsina, here with us uh, today. Uh, a brief note about, um, just a housekeeping note, uh, we hope to have our um, speakers uh, present their perspectives on uh, these issues, and then towards the end of the debate, we hope to um, open the floor uh, for questions. So our audience here, please make sure that you have a pen and pencil and a notepad ready uh, to take notes because you will have the opportunity to ask them to direct them to our speakers. So without um, further ado, I'd like to turn to you, Sarah, and uh, get your perspective on what's happening in the region in terms of the energy transformation. Where are things at it? Where do we stand? Um, first, thank you for having me here today, and I'm really excited to um, delve into this topic. Um, and uh, I wanted to start off by a brief introduction of um, what Shamsina is for some context. So we construct um, solar-powered water heaters by, in, and for marginalized communities. Um, we operate out of an unplanned district in Cairo. Uh, we train and employ um, local workers, um, we construct water heaters um, for the local community. Um, and really what Shamsina has um, proven is that um, people can sort of take things into their own hands. They can create their own energy solutions um, and they can do so in a way that is environmentally, economically, um, and socially sustainable. And in terms of the region, uh, where do we stand? Where do you see the challenges and opportunities while this transformation is taking place? Um, well, it's becoming more and more clear that um, traditional energy sources are not sustainable in the long term and that we need to explore sort of alternative um, solutions. And I, I think we're starting to do that. Um, there are sort of uh, grassroots success stories and the renewable energy landscape um, is uh, sort of more decentralized and um, more uh, community-based and grassroots than um, the sort of traditional approach um, to energy. Um, we still have some way to go, but uh, I think we're on the path. Thank you, uh, Sarah. And um, Dietmar, I'd like to get your perspective on this too in terms of a regional big picture. What are the challenges and the opportunities and where do we stand at this moment? Thank you uh, also for having me here and to invite me to this uh, uh, distinguished panel. panel. Uh, it's really uh, something um, that is driving the region, the MENA region. As you rightfully said, uh, we are providing most of the energy for the world out of this region, but we are also consuming a lot of energy. There is a lot of growth in the region. And, uh, energy systems in the regions are vary from country to country, but I think one common thing is for all of them, that is that you 
uh, want to have an affordable, uh, reliable and uh, environmental friendly energy system. Having that in mind, you need to look also in your existing infrastructures into the country. So there have been a growth over the last years and certain uh, countries have grown into uh, gas, certain countries are going now into renewables and we believe that the mix of these energies is the right thing to do. So you need a mix out of traditional energies because you have an existing energy system and you can't swamp that away and say I only go now for, for renewables and therefore it's so important that you integrate both of them. Integration of both of them means also that you need to look very much on how do you distribute your energy and how do you bring your energy to the end customer, to the factories or wherever you are. And, and, and that means that you also look on the grid system and that you do uh, also there the real measures to, to increase efficiency also into the grid system. And um, talking about the various countries, they are at, at different states, of course. Uh, when you look into, for example, the UAE, where I live, I think we have a very high reliable energy system. The, 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 the movement into renewable energy is clearly visible. We have seen projects there with very low uh, uh, spending on, on CAPEX, so the, the best solar prices for generation of energy have been achieved in, in, the, in the UAE so far. Uh, they have a very reliable system behind that on gas and they are also diversifying in nuclear and in other energies. Um, going into a country like Egypt, uh, they, they had a, in the past a very unreliable uh, system. Uh, this system uh, was in an efficiency and that's still across the whole MENA region seeable in many countries that was a ver at a very low efficiency. So we had uh, 30 percent, 30 plus to 40 percent efficiency in these energy systems and uh, that needed to be upgraded. So uh, Egypt took then a decision to upgrade this system and to put it uh, on, a, on a very high efficiency and also use the natural resource, the gas, in a much more efficient way. So integration of these, these, these older systems and use of, of efficient use, emission friendly use of, of gas resources is a key for this region. Majid, would you like to uh, respond to the uh, question that we have at hand here? It seems like there's the old, the new and the transformation and, and we're right at that point where that transformation is actually taking place. So from your perspective, the challenges and opportunities and whether we are doing enough and what else can be done? So, um, I don't agree with the, the old and the new. Uh, and I think the world is always in transformation and our sector is no different. Uh, I think if you look at what's happened in the US, that's all new. All the oil and gas they've added is not only new, it's high tech, it's new technology, it's new management, it's new systems that we didn't even uh, know were possible uh, a decade ago. Uh, it's transformed their, not only their production, but their economy uh, in the US. And it's enabled the fastest drop in carbon emissions. And that wasn't uh, renewables, that was the move from coal to gas. So it's actually dangerous to lump in all the fossil fuels together. There are very big differences. And there are differences in use. There's a difference between energy use for transportation and energy use for uh, electricity for, uh, generation. I think looking at our region, the MENA region, I think we've got three challenges or problems. One, uh, we are underperforming our potential. We have half the world's oil and gas here in this region. Only a third of the oil production and only a sixth of the gas production. Uh, and we're actually losing out to these new uh, technologies and emergence from, uh, from the US uh, and elsewhere. And why is that? It, it ties into um, our consumption patterns and the subsidies uh, also, which is our second main uh, uh, challenge. We use too much. Uh, in many countries, I mean, there have been reports showing Saudi in a few decades might not have any oil to export because of the, the incredible rise. I mean, we went from one million barrels a day of the domestic consumption up to like five, getting, heading in that direction now. Uh, so that's a, the second key challenge we have, because really the only form of clean energy is using less. 100% uh, clean uh, is the efficiency side. And some countries have made good moves in that direction, but there's a lot more uh, to be done. And again, no matter all, all the efficiency building standards or education you have, if you don't tackle the subsidies, the pricing, you won't really tackle the, that consumption problem. So we're getting high on our own supply to the point that 
it's affecting our regional competitiveness. And the third challenge as I see it is learning from the mistakes of others and you know as Bill Clinton says look to the trend lines not the headlines. You know this idea that you know we're in this new energy world the reality is 80% plus of energy still comes from fossil fuels. 2% comes from re new renewables despite the tens of billions that have been invested. I totally agree with the, the fact that it could transform our region in terms of more local delivery. You know, our region still suffers from many people who don't have any, you know, energy poverty is a big challenge in our region, which is not a challenge in, in uh, the Western countries or, uh, or the OECD. And I think renewables is clearly part of the solution, but it needs to be done looking at, as Dietmar said, the affordability and reliability. Uh, if you look at some countries like Germany, for example, that said we don't want any fossil fuels and we cancel nuclear also for a local political reason and suddenly they're importing coal from the US and they have rising emissions and the most expensive energy now uh, in the OECD, whereas the US by shifting from coal to gas, thanks to the private sector, has the lowest energy costs in the OECD and the lowest energy uh, or carbon emissions, sorry, since the early 90s. Uh, so I think we need, you know, interesting, the UAE put out its vision 2050 for energy uh, and it's about 40% gas and 40% renewables because you often need the gas-fired power to back up the renewables. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. And so if you don't do that, then you import coal uh, to burn for... Uh, and what's the point? What's the point of, of forcing German consumers to spend so much on renewables every year? And then you're importing coal. I mean, it's like eating 10 Big Macs and going to the gym. What have you actually uh, <laughs> achieved? <laughs> okay, uh, Minister, there's a reason I, I wanted to hear these different perspectives to give our audience a chance to understand the underlying dynamics in this debate. And then turn to you to get the national context and then hear your perspective on the regional dynamics. Mujid says it's, you know, in some circumstances, it's like eating all these Big Macs and going to the gym. And there is also, uh, there are different perspectives on how it's being done and how it's supposed to be done now, this transformation. So I want to hear from you, um, the, the, what from your perspective, um, the, the forces that drive this transformation and the national context uh, for your country. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Well, I agree really with Mr. Majid, uh, what he has stated uh, in some aspects. Uh, and the, the challenges uh, within the regions lie in the uh, absence, not complete absence, but uh, let us say weak uh, uh, aspects of uh, managing this uh, uh, energy uh, sectors. Uh, and. Uh, Adapting the way of relying on oil and gas uh, energy uh, sectors as, as, as it is something that will last forever, okay? And not learning lessons from the past or uh, the slide down of the uh, prices because during the 80s, uh, the, 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 the energy sector, oil and gas, uh, experienced uh, sharp decline in the prices and uh, the, most of the countries were hit by that really and that was uh, one of the reasons uh, the differences between Iraq and uh, the Kuwait and uh, so on so it created political and uh, uh, you know hostilities uh, then the prices regained again and uh, everything went uh, smoothly and they forget about the uh, what happened, be, you know, before, and c continue that the system is getting this energy, and uh, uh, just uh, for uh, financial resources, okay, and you know, not uh, planning what what is after and what how to handle it and how to care for it. Uh, now, with the recent uh, slide in the prices, as you see that. Uh, we all felt the, 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 the impact and uh, many countries uh, hit. And uh, I agree with the, uh, 
you know that UAE has good put good uh, scenarios, good plan for uh, you know for the future. And as Mr. Majid said, that renewable 40 percent and others from uh, the hydrocarbon resources. But again, some people look at the uh, renewable as something substitute really for the uh, you know for the oil and gas uh, energy, which is not far, which is not true. Uh, it needs to be really looked thoroughly. This is a bad education because some people think of uh, some countries that renewable energy will, will be a sort of substitute, would substitute for oil and gas, you know, which is, uh, it cannot be. Oil and gas, in my opinion, will last for decades to come. Uh, and it will stay as uh, uh, needed energy and uh, sustainable energy uh, and uh, that this region will, will continue to, uh, to contribute for more and more, you know, for, for this. But as I said, the most important thing is management and the planning for, for this uh, energy. Uh, planning is not easy uh, as far as I am you know, my, as far as Iraq, my country is concerned, we rely about 97% of uh, our revenue on oil and gas, really on revenue from mostly oil. And uh, uh, we spend lots of, lots of uh, energy share on electricity generation. And again, this is not being well uh, looked after, it's not well managed, it's only uh, feeding the uh, electrical power station with the uh, hydrocarbon, gas, oil, and these things, and let things go, uh, you know, as if passing days, just passing time, with no real, you know, no, no genuine uh, study and thorough uh, how we tackle it. Are we going to stay on this uh, mode of uh, uh, operation, this mode of just feeding the, uh, the electrical stations with uh, oil and gas and then, uh, you know, uh, not doing anything and ultimately things will collapse. It's not collapsing completely, but it's as if, you know, leaving things uh, uh, as they are and uh, the, the destiny. Uh, I do, as I said the other day that uh, the trouble with this region is the uh, poor planning. And the poor planning that we, okay, the revenue of oil is continuous and uh, people are living in good standard and these things. And uh, once there is a shock in this uh, energy, then everybody uh, try to sort of, uh, uh, you know, get, wake up and say, oh, this is what's going on. I don't have breakfast. I don't have, uh, you know, what shall I do? Then. Uh, after, you know, the things uh, get back to their uh, bit of normality, then back to sleep. So it's, just, <laughs> it's, uh, it's like that, that I look at it, like, you know, uh, this is... The is there not a way to fix that, though? Because you're pointing to this habit, that's what I understand from what you're saying, and, and plan, you're, you're, you're pointing to uh, th th this lack of planning or our problems with planning as, as part of the problem. So I'm curious what your recipe is, because I also saw my other panelists nodding and, and some smiling, so I'd like to get your responses too. What, what's, what's the solution to that? Sorry, what do, what do you mean? What do no, no, the, the, in, in terms of having better planning habits, because this clearly ties into the whole picture. So I just wanted to hear from you because everyone else was nodding and smiling. How can we get better at that since you are the minister doing most of the planning and, 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 and no, you sit with decision I'm makers? I'm doing my best to, uh, uh -huh. you know, minister is not enough. It's a state, yeah, yeah, it's a state yeah. planning. That's what I wanted to hear from you. That's why I wanted to hear Myself, I'm <laughs> shouting and, uh, do, you know, <laughs> trying to do something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but this is not enough, really, in chaotic situation, like, uh, you yeah. know, because the country is different. They look at the minister that bring, uh, just get oil production high and gas and that, let things go, uh, let life go as it is, uh, you know. Uh, so. mm -hmm. Sami Khorebi, I, I wanted to turn to you because yeah, we made you wait a little bit, but here we have the full picture, it seems like, uh, from energy poverty to our problems with planning. This is our picture. So I wanted to get your perspective on what, how these assets, energy assets, can be uh, used 
for a sustainable future, and then we'll move on to the technology um, aspect with sure. you. Dipar. Okay, well, uh, I appreciate going last because it gave me a chance to hear the insights of, of, of my fellow panelists. And uh, one thing I notice is we're saying renewable energy or, or hydrocarbon-based energy. In reality, energy is very agnostic. People don't care where their kilowatt hours are coming from, whether it's from gas, coal, or, uh, or from the sun. The end user typically doesn't care much. It it's ultimately uh, comes down to cost and, and price per kilowatt hour. So to, to quote Majid, who, quoting Bill Clinton, we, we take a look at trend lines. Uh, and from 2007 to today, the cost per kilowatt hour of, of solar energy has gone down approximately 80%. So when I started the company in 2007, we build and operate solar power plants. Uh, the cost per kilowatt hour for a plant was around 35 US dollar cents. Today, we're down to closer to three US dollar cents uh, in, in certain power plants that are being built. Most recently in Dubai, there was a plant in Abu Dhabi at three US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. So that's great news for the end user because of course we're seeing low cost in, in energy. Uh, now, solar, when it's being produced, can only really cater to some of the peak demand, which is in the middle of the day when the sun is shining, uh, which could create some challenges to, to grids. So again, there was a, the, the, the example of Germany that was cited uh, and the challenges they face now having to import coal. Um, Germany was, was a leader in, in solar. I think they, they, they bear the cost to a lot of the rest of the world who are the beneficiary of installing tremendous amounts of, of capacity when solar was more expensive between 2004 and 2011. The majority of their installed capacity came in. Uh, that cost is, as I mentioned, declined massively over that period of time. So had they done what they did today, they wouldn't be facing that same kind of challenge in terms of cost. Um, looking at trend lines moving forward, renewables are, are very complementary to grids. We're displacing peak energy uh, and um, Right now, we definitely need to be part of a balanced grid where we're using multiple elements. We're using gas, we're using nuclear in some parts of the region, uh, and it is a portfolio of, of power that is required in order to, to ensure that we have a stable grid across the board. One trend line that we uh, really re that we need to take a look at uh, and, and take very seriously in the region, which is quite dependent on oil and gas revenues as well, uh, is the advancements that are taking place in storage technologies. Uh, when I started the company, I'm sorry, actually between 2011 to 2015, China's capacity of solar module production went up six times, uh, which was a huge contributor to the huge decline in the cost of solar energy. That same kind of increase, which is a six times increase in, in uh, capacity, is occurring in lithium ion batteries today. So between 2016 and 2020, we are going to have a 6x increase in lithium ion battery capacity. We're seeing, we're in the middle of it actually, as, as a solar integrator, we're seeing massive declines in the cost of solar plus storage. What does that mean? Renewable baseload energy. Uh, we are in the next 10 years going to be at a point where for probably somewhere around five US dollar cents, we'll be producing 24 hour electricity, very consistent without the challenges you have of having to import other sources of fuel. Uh, and that becomes a value proposition where uh, you are producing your own electricity in your own country without having to depend on foreign sources of feedstock, not even touching on the environmental impact. So uh, there is going to be a huge transformation in the next 10 years with uh, the advancements of storage technologies. I think the impact in terms of um, the cost and the value of, of, of oil is going to is going to be something we have to take very seriously in a region that is quite dependent on the revenues of hydrocarbons. So I think we need to take a look at this, take a look at the trend lines, understand what the implications of these trend lines are, uh, and um, both from a technology perspective, from a capacity perspective, uh, and from an economic pl planning perspective, uh, see how we proceed with this new reality. Mm -hmm. And let's turn to you, Dietmar Seerstorfer, about that. The new technology and new critical uh, the critical uh, innovation areas in the in the field of power generation that allows for this transformation. What's new? What's taking place? 
I agree 100% with Sami when, when he says storage is something that we have to work on. And I think we are also there at the beginning of an avenue. We have today battery storage, uh, which gives us maybe in, in an hourly range uh, the possibility to store. Uh, we are also looking into possibilities to store energy on a longer range. Uh, when you go into uh, days and weeks, then uh, there are also solutions uh, with hydrogen. We are working on that. Uh, so you generate out of solar energy, you, you put a hydrolyzer up and you generate uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen you can use then again to, to burn it uh, and, and, and make uh, electricity out of it. But you can also use it in other forms. You can use it as a chemical feedstock. A petrochemical feedstock, uh, you can use it uh, also uh, to fuel cars. We have fuel cell cars, uh, that's also something that maybe evolves over the, the next years. So at the end of the day, there is uh, more than, than, than one use for, for hydrogen. So that's a technology that is evolving and, and is coming up now. Um, looking into the existing energy systems, uh, we definitely believe that still there is a lot of possibility to increase efficiency, so to upgrade existing systems, energy systems, and to develop new technology to further enhance, uh, uh, for example, also gas turbines. And, and imagine you have an energy system that has 30% efficiency, and you then put a new gas turbine in, and you have 60% efficiency with the same amount of gas, you can produce double the power. So uh, imagine all the growth that we still see in energy in the region uh, can be managed with the same amount of feedstock that you have today in, in terms of, of uh, primary energy. But also technologies like digitalization, which is also a scheme of the whole uh, economic forum, uh, are evolving uh, very much into the power industry. So to to run power plants, existing power plants also more efficient, to run the grid system more efficient, to manage better the demand side and the generation side, to integrate them more tightly. Uh, these kind of technologies are evolving more and more and, and finding their way in, in, in the region also. And may, some of the countries are even leading on that. And um, that's something that, that will change also the way how we use energy. And that will also give us possibilities, what you said, Margin, to better manage our, our usage of energies in the households, in the industry, and elsewhere. And that's something that, that we really see on the technology side evolving at the moment. Mm -hmm. And Minister, I'd like to turn to you about the same question. How, how is the region doing in terms of um, embracing new technologies to, to become more efficient? How is the region doing? How is Iraq doing? Would you like to share your perspective on that? Well, I myself really believe that uh, the, 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 the things should go together, you know. I mean, the renewable energy should be looked after and should be uh, uh, developed, you know. And at the same time, the technology of oil and gas, the present energy should be developed. Uh, at the same time, you know, they go parallel uh, and other renewable aspects like this. Uh, uh, nuclear and uh, other uh, sources should go together uh, because nobody can really foresee the future. Uh, I remember during the 70s and uh, during the 73 war, there was a, you know, a bureau in London, uh, the new energy bureau uh, headed by uh, the Dr. Yamani of Saudi Arabia then uh, oil minister of Saudi Arabia and they had the really uh, conflicting uh, reports. One of the reports uh, uh, indicated that the oil prices would go over a hundred dollars, which happened really. And the other reports say that uh, once it gets to hundred then the nuclear energy will come up and the nuclear energy will take about 70% of the energy uh, uh, portion, you know. And uh, then the oil prices will go down and down, which did, did really did not happen after 50 years of the, their uh, prediction. Then the nuclear energy now is not contributing much to the... Uh, it's contributing, but not as to as forecasted, really. So all in all, and the same for coal, some sources uh, predicted that coal will be uh, the dynamo and the, will be the strong source for the uh, renewable energy as uh, you know, so a source that could really substitute somehow for oil and gas and uh, did not uh, happen. So all in all, I think 
Uh, no, all, all they should go together. I mean, we, we, I, I don't think that uh, the electrical cars and these things will be uh, really much of impact on oil and uh, the dynamo of oil and, uh, and gas. It will affect it maybe a bit, but it will stay as dominant uh, source of energy. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Musa. Um, sure. On the question of technologies, um, Shamsina approaches this by creating very simple and affordable technologies. Um, and we are low tech in a field that I think assumes that um, you need something very high tech um, to sort of um, be effective. Um, so Shamsina's design is innovative. It's user centric. It's easy. Um, for its target population to build, um, to use, to install. It's cheap, it's durable. Um, and I think there is a lot of potential for these uh, low-tech solutions and that they're often sort of overlooked um, in the field in favor of uh, sort of discovering the next uh, new thing. Mm -hmm. And um, Majid Jafar, I'd like to turn to you because while this transition is taking place, it's also important to see what the private sector can do. Can it do more and how can it be more and most? I'd like to hear from you what you think about that. So, um, again, turning to our region, and I totally agree with this point that the minister made about strategic planning. Energy, the scale of investments required and the horizon means we do need long-term strategic planning. And it's not just in our region. I don't even see elsewhere in the world that governments do this much. You know, if it comes to military hardware, there's a lot of long-term informed strategic planning. Energy is just as important. Uh, you know, it's, it's the lifeblood uh, of the economy. It's so fun, uh, fundamental that it does need that sort of planning. I mean, the UAE's 2050 plan and clear down to the number allocations uh, or expectations of the split, that's pretty rare. I don't see that in Europe. In the US, what happened is despite government, not because of government, because the private sector there took over and actually the market determined uh, wh where things ended up. So I think that's key is, on the one hand, getting our governments to really have this strategic planning, but at the same time, to actually give more room for the private sector in all aspects of the energy sector uh, to invest. So the government's role should be in revenue maximization and deciding how best to use those revenues and managing the cycles better, as His Excellency said, but at the same time really creating the regulatory framework to enable investment, whether it's at the micro level, uh, local, uh, or uh, in, in larger pieces of the infrastructure piece that, that need to be uh, addressed. In terms of uh, demand, again, we need to split. I mean, you know, Sami gave some very good explanations of what's going on on the renewable side in terms of ele electricity generation, uh, but then made an assertion about oil demand. Oil is not used for power generation. It shouldn't be. It is in some countries in our region, a few, but generally speaking, that's not, and it's not for passenger cars. I mean, the demand growth is not in passenger cars. The demand growth, is, the number one, the, the biggest, is actually petrochemicals. This is an oil product. This is an oil product. This is an oil product. Uh, a lot of what you're wearing are, uh, is oil products. Uh, freight, all these trucks going across Asia. Shipping, air travel, and, fr uh, and transportation. None of those have renewable uh, solutions at, uh, at the moment. So it, we need to split. I mean, if we're talking gas and renewables and, and other forms for electricity generation, it's quite a different discussion from looking at transportation. Uh, so we, need, we can't just group them all in together. And again, I, I agree with what His Excellency said. Electric cars, they're really cool and they're getting a lot of attention. They're 0.8% of the market. And what's the point of having an electric car if the electricity is produced using coal? You're having a coal-fired car. You may move the pollution outside the city, it's good for you as a city dweller, but if we care about climate change and the global impact, that's not actually moving the needle. We need to look at the, the generation of the electricity. So today in the US, a new petrol-fired car with the new emission standards, which are more than twice as efficient as they were 20 years ago, is actually cleaner in most states, California accepted, than an electric car. 
So the, what's really changed things uh, in terms of emissions is the emission standards. Uh, I don't see Trump changing those, uh, despite what his views on climate change might be. The truth is cars are very different today uh, than they were in the past. So again, we need to look beyond the headlines. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we have enough time for the questions too, but before we do that, Dietmar, if you could share with us uh, Germany's example too. Mm -hmm. Germany has been through this, and are there any lessons to learn from that example? There are definitely lessons to learn, and, and Majid, you mentioned it already. Uh, we, we, Germany took uh, around a century change, uh, took on the uh, German Energiewende, as we call it, uh, and they they decided to clearly move in direction of uh, renewables. Uh, at that time, they had also no plan. Uh, I would say there was not a plan. There was the plan to say we go into renewables, but there was no plan also to use the grid and to extend the grid, and that's what they suffer still today. So the grid has to be extended because we have a lot of wind turbines in the North Sea and in the Baltic Sea and the energy is the load centers are in the south of Germany so the, the energy transportation is still a challenge. So to have a long term planning is one of the key learnings and that is also what we discussed today to have that in mind. What they have definitely done with the energy when they is paved the way for solar energy. I think uh, that it got really acquainted to where we are today with solar energy was part of the of the success story, but there is a big price tag attached to that which the, which the German uh, consumer, the households are paying at the moment, not the industry, the households are paying that, uh, the, the, the price is about 30 uh, euro cent for the kilowatt hour or dollar cent for the kilowatt hour, which is a huge uh, uh, burden of course in, in the economy. On the other side, uh, as you rightfully said, the the uh, CO2 emissions didn't went down too much, um, but uh, it created uh, a new spirit in the in the in the whole community also, and that is I think what is taking off now and will change the energy landscape of Germany again, uh, because we had at that time we had four or five big utility providers in in Germany. Uh, today they are still there, but they play a minor role. There are uh, more than 1.2 million generators now which are generating electricity that opens up complete new business models that opens up business models also in terms of storage so people can combine together their energy generation they have on the rooftop or some windmills and they combine it and they sell energy and they use also their own energy which is then at the lower prices so new models are coming up now new business models which are helping them also to manage the cost that has been of course going outrageous uh, uh, with the whole energy and uh, uh, as such and I think uh, on the on the long run this is a very success when you look on the the, the 10 15 years where the decision has been made there is a high cost attached to it mm -hmm. and um, at this point I'd like to turn to uh, you here um, sitting around us and listening carefully to this conversation here anybody um, if you have any questions please uh, this is the time for you to take the opportunity anyone and behind me, I can't see anyone. Yes, sir, please. Sorry, I can't turn back, but please identify yourself and, and, and state your question. Anyone else? Uh, my name is uh, Hashim Zahabi. I'm from uh, Sharjah. Um, I'm an entrepreneur in the, the renewable energy, and we have a product called WaveX. It's the energy trading platform. So I want your views on how... So our vision is to, with Dubai and Diwa collaborating with us, is to push that energy generation onto the citizens and let them do the initial investments. And because we are uh, highly dense with solar energy, uh, we are predicting that the residents, if uh, they have the volume, can produce more than what they consume and then they can sell it to the high consumed uh, entities or private sector. So from your perspective, in the long run, do you think that those companies that actually produce energy for the households become obsolete and just the Uber for transforming those energies between different individuals? Thank you. Okay, anyone? May, 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 uh, just a comment on okay. that here. I, I, think, I think it's the right way to go in a direction of saying we have also the, the, the end users and the households to use them and, and, and produce energy. I think that's also what the German energy when it tells is, is a good measure to do, to have a platform where you uh, exchange then and trade also this energy. 
Uh, that's also a model that is, uh, in the meantime, in Germany very much established. We have the, the German Strom exchange uh, or, or power exchange in Leipzig. You can buy in the meantime on a, on a daily, on a, in, in the future, on an hourly and maybe on a minute rate power uh, at that uh, power exchange. And, you, and the prices are fluctuating like we, we see it in a, in a trade exchange. And uh, this is good because this brings efficiency into the system. So I think that's definitely the right move. Uh, seeing the sheer magnitude of energy that we still use and that also needs to be replaced in, in the whole region, I don't think that uh, with, a, with a pure uh, solution with, with households or whatever, we will come to a stage that uh, 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 they will replace all the traditional utilities. Uh, because uh, at least to, according to studies that we have done and they are uh, in line with the international studies, uh, the energy demand or the energy generation capacity in the whole MENA region is at the moment at 290 gigawatt. That will increase to 480 something, uh, whatever it will be in the next 15 years. There is a lot of replacement. So to, to do all this new generation now with, with, uh, with such kind of, of ideas, I think that's simply from the magnitude to, to sizable. Sarah, did you want to respond to that? or? Um, so, in addition to the, I mean, beyond the sort of practicality of it, I do think that the concept itself is um, is a very interesting one. And as technology um, develops and it becomes more um, feasible, that it'll be, um, it could be a very transformative practice. I mean, one of the things it does as a starting point is sort of create a sense of um, accountability and have people sort of measure um, what they're using and what they're creating. And so it's a really interesting model. Yes, sir. My name is Sam Judah. I'm the chairman of uh, two companies uh, that developed uh, a wind farm and a solar farm and were the first to be um, commissioned and connected to the grid. My, my question is, by, by the way, we share something. Your company is called Shamsina. My company is called Shamsuna. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my question is, we're all aware of the flucu fluctuations in prices of um, oil and gas, and we've seen these fluctuations uh, um, and prices go up to um, um, 100 and over $100 uh, in, in the past few years. With renewables, the prices have been going down, and you've, you've talked about that. And um, we haven't seen any fluctuations. We've just seen them come down to, as you correctly stated, about 80%. How do we foresee the future? Because I don't think the prices are going to be fluctuating like on oil and gas. Where, where will the prices of, um, of solar and wind um, and other renewables uh, be in the next few years? Especially that with the advances of technology, you can harvest more, more energy um, um, out of these renewables. Thank you. Thank you. That's for Sami Horebi. That question. I can, I can sure, go ahead. That. So, um, you know, we, we believe in something uh, that was, uh, it's a theory from BCG in, in the 60s called the experience curve. Every time you double global uh, capacity of, of production of, of a technology, the cost goes down by 20%. Uh, so we, you know, we, we treat it kind of like Moore's Law. And in, in the renewable industry, it's called Swanson's Law. Um, Swanson's law has perfectly been applied. So as we see continued increase in installed capacity, just, just without any technological advancements, just an increased capacity, manufacturing efficiencies, I think banking, engineering, everything really just draws down the price. Um, there are some disruptive concepts that are taking place right now, like the, so, uh, the storage, both uh, you know, the hydrogen side of it or just the lithium ion side of it. We think that there will be a continued decline. Uh, the pace of the decline will be dependent on how quickly uh, the global markets, as well as the regional market, uh, install additional solar onto the grid. It's gone down much more quickly than any of the IEA's predictions, any industry predictions. Nobody has been right in terms of uh, guessing how quickly solar has, has gone down. We think the same is going to apply to, uh, to the storage side of things. I'm not an expert on wind, but I know as there is additional capacity coming online, uh, and even things like the banking system and lending becoming more sophisticated uh, to these things. It's not just the technology, it's also the financial community and, and the regional financial community becoming more uh, comfortable with the technologies and, and comfortable with lower returns even on the investments. I think we will see a continued trend decreasing in, in the cost of technology. I don't think we can get to zero, uh, but um, we, we keep getting closer and closer on a kilowatt hour cost. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, really just uh, uh, small elaborations. Uh, w there is not much uh, uh, knowledge and education about renewable energy. 
Lots of people think that uh, renewable energy, we have plenty full of sun, sands, wind, and these things. Why don't we get this uh, energy from what God, the, the gift of God gave us? But this is not really right because uh, 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 they are, they, it costs lots sometimes. Uh, in Iraq, we had the experience in uh, this uh, uh, cells, the sun cells, and uh, uh, to create to generate electricity. And uh, the other day, I saw that the cost uh, almost twice as the uh, that of the uh, the, the oil, uh, uh, the the crude and gas. Really, uh, the megawatt cost us about one million. Uh, dollar and uh, while, while with the cells of sons and these things it cost about 1.5 and so on I was shocked really and when I went deep into this uh, it needs a lot of investment it needs a lot of even the operation of it is not easy because it needs regeneration and so on so it is not you know as it, people think that's uh, something available let's get it you know Mm -hmm. So it needs a lot of education and uh, knowledge about this. I saw you first. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I would like to put some considerations considerations on the table. First of all, that the Excuse cost me, of solar. Sorry, I'm Andrea Panizzo, Enel Green Power of Enel Group. Um, it's a utility. Uh, some considerations. First of all, cost of solar energy and wind reached uh, $24 per megawatt hour in Abu Dhabi and Dubai and 29 for wind in Morocco. And installation costs uh, of solar is uh, today is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 million euros per megawatt and wind is around one. By considering these uh, values, considering then uh, many utilities uh, like uh, uh, Total, uh, Shell, uh, Statoil, Exxon uh, turned into renewables. They were oil companies. Uh, my consideration is that uh, the transformation is already in place. So, and this, uh, let's say, uh, evident uh, everywhere. And it's coming also here uh, in uh, Middle East. There are many countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait, uh, Emirates, uh, uh, Jordan, here, uh, that introduced uh, new schemes and new tenders for renewables. So um, I think transformation is already here. And uh, the next transformation we are facing in, uh, in Europe is transformation uh, uh, after renewables, uh, which is transformation of the grid. So we're speaking about uh, smart meters, smart grids, um, digitalize the grids in order to, to make the grid sort of platform for the customers. So um, how do you see these uh, transformations? It's for all the, but in particular for Siemens. Dick, would you like to respond? Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree with you that these transformations are happening. I mean, uh, it's, it's evidently seeable that uh, the, the companies are moving in that direction and that's also, I think, what what the panel elaborated on that uh, this transformation is on the move and that this what 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 we call energy mix is still there so the companies and you mentioned in particular the, the, the international oil majors that they are moving into renewables but they are still also in the oil business so it's exactly showing the mix and i couldn't agree more uh, on your statement on the grid that's a very important thing to look uh, and i mentioned it also earlier that you look on on the grid uh, in connection with your generation, because sometimes this is forgotten. People look on the generation, what can we do in solar, what can we do in wind, and then you forget to bring the energy finally to your consumers, and, and therefore it's so important that you do this grid integration with that, that you have the right measures in place in terms of size of the grid, but also in terms of platform so that you integrate it to your end customers, so that you manage it in a different way. And, and, and absolutely uh, agree with you on your statement that this is happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. We can do one last question, the one from there. Okay, you, go ahead. Nadira Suez, a professor of medicine, University of Illinois, um, United States. Um, 
We use energy a lot in medicine, whether it's in imaging techniques or treating cancer cells or radiation therapy. It saves lives, but at the same time, I'm thinking about sustainable sources of energy and whether there has been a cost-effective models and um, health safety models built in uh, to study the possibility of risks of uh, um, occupational health related um, to that. Uh, so while the emission test standards are great, but I'm st I still see in my clinic uh, a lot of occupational lung diseases related to that. So my, my concern is, are we prepared uh, to deal with the health consequences and do we know what is the safest in the future um, in terms of health risks with sustainable energy? Thank you. Vijay, would you like to respond? So I'm not an expert on this, but I found a very interesting report that just came out two days ago uh, ranking uh, these health crises uh, and, and air quality. And the UK performed really, really badly. I mean, predictably in some ways, you've got 60 million people on a small island and so on. And actually, countries in our region, despite scoring badly on energy efficiency because of air conditioning and subsidized pricing like the UAE and Qatar, actually scored quite well on energy, on, uh, sorry, air, air, air quality and, and number. And it actually looked at deaths. It looked at deaths per 100,000 uh, as a result of air quality. So the fact that that's now being measured and analyzed uh, and feeding into this energy uh, debate, uh, the health aspects, I think is very important. Beyond just, you know, the, the climate change and, and sustainability on a global level. I mean, there we... You know, the three biggest things are the shift from coal to gas. The emergence of renewables is important, but it makes no sense to do that in isolation of the shift from coal to gas. And then using less, uh, you know, efficiencies in many countries have a long way to go. Uh, and then the third uh, is the whole, you know, the rainforest. I mean, CO2 is a, is a system. You've got production and consumption. And when, when we grew up, it was all about saving the rainforest. Nobody talks about it anymore. Creating maybe some market system where, where countries that have that resource actually get a value in, in sustaining it. Uh, and at the annual meeting in Davos, we heard about some new genomic engineering approaches to actually create cash crops that consume much more CO2 uh, than, than normal, up to five times more. So we need, we need to look at the consumption as well as, uh, mm -hmm. as the emissions. Mm -hmm. We have only a few minutes left before we end the conversation. So I would like to go back to our main guiding question, which is how we can imagine this transformation in a way that it helps us secure a sustainable future. So I'd like to get your final remarks on that question, which was our main question. And then let's go around like that. And I'm sure those of you who didn't have a chance to ask your questions, our panelists will be available afterwards. So. Ibar, let's start with yeah. you. Yeah, I think uh, what I learned today in this panel and, and, and what we discussed is that uh, we have uh, to do a long-term planning. We, we have to look on holistic on the energy system to supply reliable, affordable power with low emission standards, as I said earlier. This uh, goes hand in hand that we also look into the subsidies, in my opinion, so that there should be no subsidies because that drives uh, inefficiencies. Uh, we should really get rid of subsidies or very low uh, if we want to enable something. And that, I think, leads then to a good energy system. And, and in particular, in, in the countries where we are in the MENA region, we have to look country by country how we do that. So this planning needs to be country by country. There is no recipe that we can take from one to the other and say, this is how you should do it. Mm -hmm. Minister. Well, I, I agree that, uh, uh, and as I stated, that uh, the energy system needs to be looked at uh, carefully and extensively and uh, uh, managed well, you know, just managed well and uh, uh, to look at the changes really carefully because we cannot say that this sect is going to be uh, the dominant uh, uh, substance, and we leave the others. And I, as I said, that they all go together. I mean, the renewable energy, other factors, and so on, they go together. But uh, uh, the, 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 the oil and gas sector should be looked at carefully, and uh, uh, the, the management of this sector is very, very important. Uh, 
uh, I, as I said, that uh, renewable energy is not always uh, of, you know, of great impact as people think, because it, it has cost, uh, it, has a lot, it has a lot of difficulties, it has a lot of challenges, uh, like the uh, oil and gas, uh, really. And uh, if you look at the gas as, as a clean energy, then it is, uh, you know, it's, it has good future really for uh, even better sometimes in some parts of the uh, renewable energy. Uh, and uh, the gas here in the, this region not, was neglected for a long time and it was, uh, it kept on flaring and burning for, for decades really. Now it's moving in a good direction, but not enough. Uh, as I'm saying in my country, we burn a lot of gas uh, quantities and uh, we burn about 60% uh, of our production of associated gas. So this is really, this is energy, you know, this is clean energy, it's good energy. So all in all, if things manage well, then the results would be positive. So I totally echo um, both the strategic long-term planning and the holistic uh, approach. And I would add to that the importance of more flexibility with our governments here in, in the MENA region in terms of investment models to, to get private sector investment in every part of the chain. Sami Karibi, and then very quickly, Sarah Musa. Just to add a renewable perspective to it, I think we, sh we shouldn't underestimate the pace of change. Um, the, the reality is it's happened in, in many industries in the past. Uh, most recently, you could say with telecommunications, and the adaptation of first the mobile phone and now the smartphone. Uh, the change when, when I think you know, uh, the, the cost is more effective with decentralized sources of energy uh, and uh, the, the technology is something which is very much uh, of value to the end user happens a lot more quickly than we expect and then most of the, the predictions um, predict. And um, we're seeing it happen in, in the, the energy industry. There is a, a real shift in terms of technology really being applied to the energy industry, both in, in the United States, the example that was uh, cited in, in terms of fracking and getting gas out for, at a more cost-effective fashion, uh, or in the renewable industry with, with the real scaling of, of our industry uh, and massive drop in the cost. Um, so understanding how quickly things are moving, it's not like the old days where it would take years for, for the impact of something to occur. It's often uh, in, in, in much shorter periods of time. So the decline is, is going to continue to cost and hopefully one day will lead to energy access to 100% of the region. Today there's still 12% of the region that does not have access to energy and decentralized uh, renewable sources could be mm -hmm. the solution for that. Sarah, very quickly, a few words from you too. Sure. So His Excellency um, mentioned earlier that um, energy becomes more visible when there's a problem, when there's an issue. And the topic of subsidies has also um, come up. And I found in my work that those most willing to embrace renewable or alternative sources are, um, are those with low to no access to energy. Um, and in terms of subsidies, I think until people sort of start internalizing the actual costs of energy and the environmental um, costs of traditional energy sources, um, that there really will be no push to finding an alternative. So uh, mm -hmm. that's something that I think we'll start seeing as um, the discussion of subsidies progresses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks to all of you, to our panelists and, uh, and our audience for being here. This brings us to the end of our session on transforming energy. Thank you for watching.